Well, hello everyone. Welcome, welcome. Welcome to those in the room. We're here at the uh, Eros Monastery yet again, and we've got a lovely group of people here. And welcome all of you beautiful people on screen. Um, I see some faces from last time, some new faces. And let's dive right in, shall we? Yeah, yeah let's do it, let's do it. So um, we're going to continue our look at the eternal, ferocious dance between humanity's rejection and acceptance of the esoteric, the mystical, and the spiritual. And so just to recap for those who weren't here last time in the first session, I covered a bit of my personal journey accepting different modes of esoteric thought and practice, things like the Kabbalah, the Tarot, spirit animals and guides, shamanic healing, you know, acupuncture. I don't know if that qualifies as esoteric. I'm sure once upon a time it did. It was new for me. And, and other practices that made a huge difference in my life. Theta healing, which uh, Alexis is a, a master of. I have a little bit of feedback here. Is that great? Um, and I would say more accurately than me accepting these kind of fields and realms, I was invited into them. And I'm very grateful for that. And we looked at the notion of conservators. Those people are hardwired to resist change at all costs often for very, very good and important reasons. And we looked at adapters, those who, or adopters, as um, Reese also puts it, those who thrive on exploration of the unknown and the untested. Um, I think we have some adopters, adapters and adopters in this room right here, but some conservators too, and it's important to have both. And, um, you know, as I said last time, both are really necessary and each is seeking to become the most expressed version of itself. So you get the nobility and the guardianship of the conservator, and then you get the fluidity and the innovation and the boundlessness of the adapter. And our work here is to clear away the mutual mistrust and fear so that we can see each other clearly. And part of that requires that we break out of the spell or the trance of cynicism so that our vision is clear, so that we don't miss anything, but we don't see anything that's not there either. We just see things as they are. That's the, you know, the, the, the end journey of most traditions is to get there. And so in the, in the um, uh, spirit of the, the esoteric and the magical and the mystical, I invite you to contemplate this apple and this orange. This apple will be a totem or a symbol for the adapters, for the explorers, for the fluid, boundless beings. And the orange will be a totem for the, for the conservators, for the guardians, for the, for the nobility of that. And my little crystal, which is the first crystal I ever owned in my life, which I love, will uh, help connect the two. So just throughout this talk, if you wish to, nobody's obliged to do anything, um, just contemplate them in your ambient attention. When they pop up in your attention, just put a lot of loving energy towards both of them and that they find each other. Okay, good. So, all right, now we're ready for some uh, deep water. Okay, so, uh, I said in the promos for this, I was going to use Sheila Kelly's S Factor Movement and Studio, and I hope she doesn't mind. I think we might have. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, we have a, a, a pole dancing instructor and teacher. I think she studied with S Factor and is a big fan, Cara Joy. Um, and I hope Sheila won't mind me talking about her. I've never met her, so um, that gives me sort of a sense of objectivity and perspective on all this. And I'm no expert in the organization or the movements or how it works, but I know how these dynamics work and how they play out. And um, so some of the 
key resources I looked at was a Hollywood Reporter article called Stripped Down, The Undoing of Hollywood's Favorite Pole Dancing Studio. And it was by Gary Baum, Katie Kilkenny, and Rebecca Sun. And then, uh, and that was uh, released in sort of summer of 2021. And then there was a Netflix film about Sheila Kelly and her work uh, called Strip Down and Ri Strip Down Rise Up. And it was made by Michelle, Michelle Ohayon. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. And then I also watched just for fun, the first 20 minutes or so of um, Dancing at the Blue Iguana, which was the film that Sheila Kelly starred in along with um, uh, Daryl Hannah and several other act actors and actresses, Bob Wisdom, and um, uh, which was her inspiration for forming S Factor and for starting it. Um, and it was kind of funny to me and not at all surprising or coincidental that the little bit of the plot I saw involves a hitman who moves into a seedy motel next to the strip club and is kind of counting out his bullets while he's learning uh, English through this audiobook and watching them come and go out of the strip club. <laughs> and he is, it looks like from what I could tell, trying to assassinate her, char her character, Stormy. <laughs> so there you go, some, some amazing foreshadowing. So I, I call their article uh, Murder at the Blue Iguana instead of Stripped Down. Um, and so, but we'll, refer, we'll be referring to them interchangeably throughout this presentation. So in some ways, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of an odd choice to, to use because S Factor wasn't obviously esoteric or mystical or even spiritual in their orientation, not that I know of. It was more about sort of feminine empowerment and very sort of modern in outlook. But um, it has its kind of ritualistic markers. There's the, the low lighting, the embrace of eroticism and sensuality, um, and it's got its totemic objects, like there's the pole and the platform heels and the skimpy outfits and the music. And so it's got its, all the markers and the hallmarks of a kind of um, esoteric, mystical experience that's designed to guide you into the, into the mystery. And another reason that I chose it is because I think the reason it got treated in the way that it did is that it dared to venture beyond mere fitness and to dip its little painted toenails into the waters of healing and spiritual growth through body-based practice. And, and I believe that's why it got um, hammered so hard. And so it's a great canvas to kind of watch these things play out. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna talk just briefly about containers because they're relevant to what happened to the Hollywood Reporter and they're relevant to the, to the mystical. Because um, containers are really critical for exploring the mystical. Because when, when you go into that realm, you wanna know that you can return um, and that you can explore it, but you, you won't necessarily get lost there. Um, but everyone wants to go there. Even the most hard-bitten conservator wants to go there and does go there, sometimes voluntarily and sometimes they're just dragged along by addiction or whatever, whatever gets them by the scruff of the neck. And so, um, and in psychedelics, which are kind of now a very well-studied way to access the mystical, the sort of set and setting, which is the, the, the sort of environment um, in which you have this experience are crucial to making sure that it, it actually has the healing properties that are its potential and not the dangerous properties that are also inherent within it. And so society's given us a few containers. And once again, I'm going to try and keep myself to 30 minutes. And if we have to cut off part of this and do it for the next one, we'll do that. But I think we'll get through most of this. So society's got a couple of containers that it says like, these are, these are cool, these are okay. You can go ahead and explore, you can get your freak on inside of these, it's fine. Like 
superhero movies, like the most popular form of entertainment, focuses on outsider characters like a shaman with magical or occult powers um, who's initiated into something by some kind of teacher or, or born with it. And they use those powers for either good or evil or both. And so that's basically what people consume is, is, is this on, on a very regular basis, regardless of your, your background. And then there are other ones like music videos and music concerts. I mean, you see like Lana Del Rey and, you know, they're all at the country club. And then the next thing they've all turned into wolves at night and the full moon. And, you know, there's all these hot women who become wolves. And, it's great and you can't like you can't talk about that stuff and you can't do that stuff normally but in a music video it's cool you can go for it um, although i think some of those freedoms around expression are you know there's more and more attempts to curtail them in ways that i don't think we've seen since the sort of 60s and 70s artworks and then even sporting events you know it's kind of gladiatorial it's ritualistic there's sort of standard things that you see within them and it's this you know, you're looking for the shared experience of flow through the bodies of these athletes in a form of worship. And I bring up the container point because educational contexts, I think, were previously given quite a large leeway to be like, okay, if it's educational and you're in a class setting and there's a teacher and there's some sort of system around it, you know, is as long as everyone's an adult, you can go for it. Like, do you think, do what you want to do in there and explore whatever you want to explore. But in recent years, I think in the media, educational contexts have come, be, be, come to be treated with tremendous suspicion. And I think S factor is a really good case in point of, of how this happens. Okay, so um, so I told you about a little bit about Sheila Kelly, the little that I know. She starred and produced in this film, Dancing at the Blue Iguana. Um, and she found this experience so powerful that she, just, she was then approached by others to, to teach them. And then she decided to form a studio and then write a book. I'm not sure which came first. And she started this in the early 2000s and she was on Oprah and all of these uh, talk shows and things and, and it became something very popular. She expanded into several cities from her base in LA and I think there was New York and Houston and I'm not sure where else, but there were sort of five or six locations that they had. And it also created an environment in which pole dancing grew as a movement. And suddenly there were, you know, it wasn't just pole dancing in a strip club where men paid money to see women. It was women in an environment where they were doing this with each other, enjoying their sexuality, enjoying their sensuality. And so suddenly this kind of thing crossed the tracks from, uh, which is bizarrely one of the things that she got most criticized for, for daring to take you know strip culture which is you know there's a lot of black dancers lbgt dancers and then culturally appropriating it and westernizing it and making money off it and basically that was that was one of the the chief criticisms in the hollywood reporter article and from former teachers and students of hers so um so I'm gonna go back to trance states and then we're gonna talk a little bit more about the article and the trance state of cynicism. And I think one of the primary reasons that we have so much fear and hatred of any of these kinds of topics, but particularly the, well, I would say that not particularly the esoteric, but it's definitely one that gets treated with, with fear is that you know we're, we're, we're stuck in a mode where we just cannot see things as they are. I mean, definitely the, uh, the uh, LGBT movement had to live inside of that for, and still does, for decades and decades and decades. But it's not impossible to dispel the trance. And, and we've seen it happen before, and we're gonna see it happen again. Um, 
you know, and I think the, the, there's entire religious tra traditions like Buddhism, um, and I would say even Christianity, and entire families of practices and, and areas of study, including psychotherapy, which are there to enable you to awaken from this trance-like state and then form a healthier bond with reality and just be with life actually the way it is. And obviously everyone has a different perspective. Everyone's subjective. There's no one absolute truth, but there is definitely confusion. And um, everyone is, is um, ridden with confusion that our job is to gradually, you know, d um, grind it away in whatever, whatever way works for you. So uh, there's a concept in Buddhism of kleshas. Again, I'm no expert in, in Buddhism and Buddhist practice, but I found it very helpful, which is mental states that kind of cloud the mind and manifest in unwholesome actions. And they're like karmic knots that are practiced through Buddhist practice of meditation, or mantras, all of these things can help you um, undo these undo these knots. Um, you know, like I I had some just in in doing this talk. You know, my some of my knots are. It's all about test taking, it's achievement, it's risk benefit analysis, and it's proving that I like am worthy of existence. And I, to be able to do this, I had to like give up a lot of that and I found myself being woken up at one in the morning and being told like go walk down to the river now <laughs> I couldn't sleep so it's like okay down to the river I go and it's like you know I can feel the rocks I can feel the water rushing past and the Navarro River there's the night sky it's a there's a misty moon you know all the trees are in silhouette and, uh, and then I walk back up the road and I'm a little out of breath and I can feel my heart. And, and um, you know, that's what guided me on what to say, not my, the things that I normally rely on. And so that's one example of kind of undoing these, these knots. So back to cynicism as a particularly knotty and I think quite crappy knot in our, in our sort of collective conscious um, it's it's I find it to be and people may disagree with me like weirdly paradoxical because I think at the heart of it it's actually a form of naivety it's actually a form that gets very ex easily exploited by others with a motive to do that and it's why fear-mongering has made fortunes and kind of kept empires and leaders and tin pot dictators in, in place since the beginning of time because it's so so effective fear is such an effective tool to to drive human behavior and you know i saw this firsthand from both sides of the from, of the political spectrum in south africa because i grew up you know in the middle of apartheid south africa as part of the white minority and that minority definitely felt a lot of fear and loathing towards the black majority and the political elites definitely used that to remain in power and to and to um, keep their 50 year or so reign going and then you know uh, when democracy finally arrived then you know the the the, the boot is just on the other foot and and you get political elites uh, using fear of the minority white population and the fact that they've got more resources and to endlessly um, kind of uh, make excuses for, you know, mismanagement and, and failure to really lead and govern. And so it was very frustrating to, to watch this happen on both sides. And I had a lot of firsthand experiencing this in, in Zimbabwe, which was really stark you know kind of on the one side this naked racism and and hatred of a kind I, I've never seen so so much so that I didn't understand what black people are about or black people culture was about for for a very very long time I had no access point even it was so thick uh, in South Africa but but 
particularly in, in Zimbabwe. And then on the, the side of the Mugabe government, which I had a lot of dealings with because um, I was involved in a lawsuit against them for many years, where they just simply help themselves remain in power and loot the country and turn it into one of the poorest uh, countries in the world by continually pointing to the, the, the fear of the white man and why it's their fault that we're not wealthy and, um, and watch the whole the country become one of the poorest countries in the world. Um, so it's, it's a very kind of um, knotty problem uh, that repeats itself everywhere you go. And so let's go back to the blue iguana and Sheila Kelly and see how it plays out in a <laughs> dimly lit, <laughs> dimly lit setting. Um, and I would say that a lot of these things, you know, the political thing that I just mentioned, they all follow a recipe. And the recipe isn't necessarily wrong. Like there is a recipe of, you know, a white minority or some minority clinging to all the resources preventing anybody else from getting access. And that needs to be addressed. You know, that needs to be addressed. Often, you know, Mandela had to become a revolutionary in order to do that. Um, but you've got to look at the, what, what are the ingredients? What are, what are people cooking with? Does it actually match the recipe? And you've got to look at the intention of the cook. And people do not do that. They just don't, in my experience. Um, and they get, they get hoodwinked uh, into making somebody a, a massive scapegoat. Okay, so um, I'm not going to go in my eight minutes into all of the um, nitty gritty and the ins and outs of exactly who said what to whom in, in, the, um, in the Hollywood Reporter thing about Sheila Kelly. But I'll sort of try and walk you through the, the sort of recipe and then briefly, as I remember the article, kind of what they said about why this ingredient matched what, what's in the, in the recipe. And so some of the kind of key classic ingredients are you allege irresponsible conduct in relation to a person in a vulnerable position. And that was something that was done throughout the Hollywood Reporter article that you know, women in a vulnerable state having some sort of traumatic experience were pushed beyond their boundaries. Um, you focus on highly charged terms that are designed to evoke fear. And so one of them was that they had this concept with the NS factor, which I don't know very much about, um, called the shattering. And it was, uh, uh, according to how Sheila Kelly was quoted in this article, it was like this physiological thing that, that would be a sort of a breaking point. And, and if you went beyond it, you, your sort of previous boundaries would melt and you would have a new level of, of power and expression. Um, but it's, and in the Hollywood Reporter side, and you know, they're, they're quoting sources who were there and they're not, you know, there, there were people who, who would say that everybody has their own experience of, of things and how they saw it and how remem they remember it. Got to remember to look at their intentions though. Um, is that this was you know, designed to break a person down so that they would remain in the thrall of the organization. Um, you should claim misuse of private information, which was done here, vulnerable and information was was used uh, to the detriment of the of the people involved you should claim that they're being overcharged for the services that they're received um, you should claim misuse of a position of trust and authority that there's and again I'm being hundred percent clear here that this recipe is important and necessary often you know, um, there, there are many examples where the, the, it matches. Um, you should paint it as something that starts out with good intentions, but then it gets twisted um, by greed, if possible, if you can do it. And then it becomes dark and dangerous. Uh, and, and suddenly people who 
and that's useful for consent as well, because then you can say, well, I, I walked into something and I stayed there for a long time, but it, I didn't notice the change. And there was an important Supreme Court case that really established that, that even though you stay in the same situation for years, if there's some event that switches it, the fact that you showed up at this guy's door um, you know, month after month, year after year, and carried on doing it, does, means that it's not, it's not your responsibility. You should uh, point to the development of a cult of personality around the leader, that the reader was really trying to like draw the attention to them. And you should suggest that this organization is straying from its lane. You know, yeah, it has a place in the world. It belongs over here, but it moved over here, and now it needs to die. Uh, and, and you should accuse it of meddling in topics which only trained professionals should involve themselves. And here I thought the treatment of Sheila Kelly was particularly unfair. You know, she never claimed to be a professional. In the movie, she works with a trained therapist. They walk through what's the difference between what she's doing and therapy. You know, she was careful to mind her P's and Q's about what's appropriate for a dance studio instructor to do within the confines of what within the, what she believes, and she could even be wrong. You know, this is the thing. It's like, does she have to be right about it? Like, she could have a slightly kooky idea about how you heal from, from X, Y, and Z. And, you know, we've lost the ability somewhat to, to distinguish between what's right and wrong and what's so dangerous that it needs to be um, destroyed in any way possible. So, um, and you should try and find your defining moment where something happens and there's the switch, uh, in which in this case it was uh, the charging of, of uh, more money through more advanced programs. Uh, you should seek to discredit the qualified experts that actually worked with the organization, which was, which was done here. There were questions raised about the therapists that they work with. Um, you should make people pick sides. You should, you should say like you're either, you're either with this harmful and dangerous organization or you're against them. Uh, and, and, if, and if you are not uh, against them, then you are the next target. And so you should make sure that that is well, well established. And then, you know, uh, this is a very long history. Uh, you should throw in some, some racism and, and cultural insensitivity allegations. And it's interesting watching how these morph. Like in, um, in 1911, the LA Times writes this article about yoga practitioners and, and calls it <laughs> the most ridiculous, <laughs> which I cannot stop repeating, a Hindu apple for the modern Eve. The cult of the low yogis lures women to destruction. And so like right there in the headline is sort of this racist slur. Here it was done, you know, times have moved on, things are slightly different. And the allegation of racism is made against Sheila Kelly which from my reading of the article, I'm not an expert, I wasn't there, I don't know who said what to whom and all of it, but it really sounded like they were mad at her for being a white woman and acting like a white woman, which she didn't, you know, she seemed to be, from what I could tell, making a good effort to, to try and broaden her horizons and broaden her scope. And, and so, so that's, a, that's a helpful thing. Uh, you want a nice rise and fall story. That's a, that's a good way to get the recipe to really hit home. This thing rises and now it needs to die. And, and everybody gets really a lot of schadenfreude out of, out of joining the, the, the death of something great uh, or something shit. Um, you should definitely in recent times, you should add in as much sort of uh, Sexuality and trauma combined, extremely popular sort of top trending topics. You, you want to get those in there. Um, and okay, so now we are just about out of time. I'll take a few more minutes and then we'll go to some questions. So, and then let's just look at the incentives for a minute. Like what is, 
what are driving these? And you need to look at the incentives from all angles. You know, um, uh, here I have no experience. I've never met these people. I've never spoken to them. I don't know anything outside of what I've read. But what I, I did notice a few things. Um, I noticed that it had a sort of Shakespearean element of the queen and all the princesses in the palace. Most of the people that spoke out were, you know, other teachers, either forming their own studios or, um, you know, and so there's this inevitable natural thing of like, time to take down the queen. And I'm not saying that happened there. I don't know. I just know that this is how things work. Um, and it's and it's and it's a queen in a in a growing empire, right? There's a, there's there's lots of there's lot, one, <laughs> she's out. There's lots of room to grow, and I believe that that the movement has continued to grow. Maybe it's not at the zenith of popularity, but there's a lot of studios out there. Um, other incentives, it, it, make, it can make the career of the journalist involved. It can take them off a kind of a boring beat and make them an expert in something that becomes a phenomenon. And so that follows with book deals, movie deals. Uh, I don't know if that's the case in, in, in this case, um, but it can definitely kind of elevate you to the level of an expert uh, from you know, lowly journalist. Um, and then deeper layers is, is it sort of, it can remove from the field uh, a source of power for others that you don't have access to or you don't understand or you don't wish to engage with, but you're pretty sure you want it out the way. Um, and it also can sort of establish people as, as sort of infantile and in need of constant protection from regulators and experts who are paid to provide such protection. And so it can be a kind of a, a sort of a shakedown. Um, so that is, you know, part two of our talk on fear and loathing of the esoteric. Uh, I'm glad you all joined. Um, before, I will uh, say a little something about our platform and then I'll take a couple of questions and then we'll wrap up and go home. So um, this talk's taking place on the EROS platform. It's something we've been working on for a very long time. We've been thinking about it for a very long time and we're very excited that it's starting to get some uh, life breathed into it. There's Sutra study every Tuesday, which is just magnificent and beautiful. And you should come along to that. Uh, there's Reese Jones's talks on AI, which are incredible. I, you know, I feel more comfortable with, with the topic and the subject in his, in his guidance and presence. There's Reverend Joanne's Bible study, where you get a totally different perspective on, on the Bible and the culture that it arose out of. Um, there's just lots of great things happening on the platform. It's growing all the time. If you're not a monthly member yet, I encourage you, like you can be a supporter of all this great content. You can have access to this library that's gonna grow over time. And you can say, I've helped made it, make it happen. It's, it's pretty affordable. Uh, so go and sign up for a membership. And um, yeah, I had, a, I had a ball again and the floor is open for questions. That was so awesome. Um, I love I love talking about this. I love hearing about the recipe of evil. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the disastrous recipe. Um, what can the like? I mean, the esoteric. I like how you said that everyone goes there, and you might go voluntarily, or you might get like dragged by your life or your addictions in some way. Um, so in a way, it doesn't have to like fight against anything, but like. What can the esoteric do in this kind of, you know, socio-political constriction climate of doom that <laughs> squeezes the joy out of it sometimes? Like what, um, you know, I know what we do on a daily basis, but like, I would just love to hear more about, about that aspect of it. Yeah, great question. I think, I mean, the biggest one I've learned is like, put your best foot forward, you know, and 
realize that if you think you're going to make a mistake doing that, it's going to be much worse if you just leave it to the recipe and you leave it to the, the fear to take care of it. So really like get organized and get coordinated and just bring out the beauty of what you do with no expectation that people are going to like it and, and just being ready for like yoga when in its history in America it was people arrested, thrown in jail, you know, um, to, you know, then presidents denying that they were doing yoga <laughs> to, <laughs> because it would actually really help, and they were, uh, to, you know, a couple of weirdos in, in the sort of uh, hippie movement to everybody's doing it. And so part of it is just making a determination you're not going to stop. I think uh, overcoming your own addiction to fear. We're all addicted to fear and adrenaline. And at some point you have to be like, well, whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen. And, and I'm not going to let the fear drive me because it's very, very powerful. It's very, very, it's a, it's a powerful biological force. Yeah. Thank you. That was great, Kev. Um, and uh, a question I had, what, what I heard you talk about was a, um, this kind of the, a framework of like a cynical framework, I think you called it. And that as a, as a um, kind of a, a, a way to kind of, I guess, I guess a, a, a diagnose and kind of dismantle a, some power source. And, and I heard you use it in, you know, a, a political context to overthrow a leader and, 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 you know, it's kind of valid usage. And, and, and then, and then as you talked about, um, you know, Sheila, Sheila Kelly example, it was much more of a, of a, um, a, a cultural war in a sense than like a, a, um, a dictatorship, for example, that stripped a country of, 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 you know, financial resources or something. And like, I wonder if you could speak to, um, like has, has, you know, have those tools always been used in culture wars or is, is it, is that kind of a recent phenomena and why and, and, and how, you know, how did that come about? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I, I do think they've, they've always been used. I mean, newspapers got incredibly rich by picking a kind of group of people that they already aligned with and then just pumping the fear as much as possible and then selling newspapers. You know, literally that's how it works. And today that's still how it works. Like the more salacious it is, which the esoteric and these kind of topics are. And so you get a, you get a hit to your business by, um, by attacking it because you key into people's fear and you key into the, the sort of money-making incentive around it. And I think the very first uses of the printing press after the Bible were political pamphlets, you know, kind of aimed at, at killing the <laughs> other side. And so I do think it has a pretty ancient history. I mean, it's definitely morphed with, with technology and social media and, you know, this, this incredible polarization, which I think... It's sort of like, well, we were very polarized and then for a minute we had some sort of common ground and now we're like, nah, screw that. Let's go back to being completely fucking polarized. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I think, I mean, I think, and the, the, the cynicism for me is the, it's the part where people already want to believe it and so they're so quick to believe it that they won't actually do their homework on what's going on. And I think that's been a sort of a pretty unchanging phenomenon over over time. Thank you. We've got a hand online. Yeah. Hey, Kevin. Hey, mm -hmm. Kevin. Um, it's funny. I was I was uh, I've been listening to this allegations against uh, Dalai Lama and like the recipe that you were talking about, and there's been like I've come across some pretty switched on people who end up believing just like the stories. And um, it just feels so insidious, the whole thing and how quickly I think people get triggered and start to believe anything that is presented in, in, in mainstream media. And I think interesting what your answers were, some of the questions that I thought you had to keep doing it over a period of time. So the, the truth surfaces and like the recipe is just kind of like make my, makes my blood boil as well. <laughs> like, um, is there a faster way? 
I hope so. I hope so. Make it really famous and like just put this recipe out so that everyone knows if they get awakened to. I don't know. As a lawyer, what what do you suggest? I mean, I do think it is getting faster. If you look at um, yoga, which which took around about, you know, if you, if you take the early attacks at sort of the, the turn, from its, when it started, it got attacked from the turn of the century, 20th century, to sort of, say, the late 80s or early 90s. You know, that was about 100 years. And then you get psychedelics, which only popped on the scene in, I don't know, maybe it was late 50s. I don't know the mm. timing, but... You know, now, well, it took nearly 70 years. So it, it does seem to be accelerating and the ability and with which you can get a message out. I mean, just like just this place here, you know, we, we have a website and we have a, you have the ability to speak and people could find it. And, and so I think that um, probably things are going faster, both in the wrong direction and in the right direction. But if we just keep, <laughs> it's up to everyone in this room, right? If you just keep meditating on the apple and the orange and the crystal, then it'll it'll go it'll go pretty fast. Um, so, Kevin, you know, we talk about these two. We got the cynicism and the adapters or adopters, and so it's like these two forces at play, right? Which is like a pattern that's mirrored a lot in like yin yang, masculine, feminine. And then like, in, and then we mentioned politics in high school, they mentioned like the pendulum just swings back and forth and it's like it's expansion and contraction. But then when you look at yoga, it's like, and maybe it'll contract again, but like as like an ohm, we were really, really out. And then we contract, like we had to contract and it's because of the, a mirroring of the political climate. So is it like, do you think that we're just kind of like, going through the throes of like expansion and contraction and that we just have to like, like what you're doing, which is amazing, like dissecting how to be the smartest inside of it. Or do you think that like, it can be in a way where like the adopters actually make an imprint, you know? And I think about like the sixties, you know, which is a really like potent time of the adopters actually like taking the, the wheel. Mm -hmm. um, and then the eighties, I don't know much about them. I think they're like more like money driven and material. So it's like this constant back and forth. So I want to hear what you have to say about that. Yeah, great, great, question. really great question. Um, I think, I mean, part of it is that everyone has adopter and conservator within them. And so and people are more like have a sort of an essence one way or another. But hell, you had it. You sure had a lot of highly progressive people that have become pretty freaking reactionary and reactive yeah. to anything that doesn't follow their dogma and that's as often where these things reveal itself it's like oh yeah you and i think this is where people get entranced and confused themselves because they were going for compassion they were going for a heart-centered communal world but then it's like the way they're trying to get there is like let's vilify and destroy this person and humiliate them to their maximum extent possible because they went against our principles. Well, maybe they did, and maybe they're good principles, and maybe they went against them in a bad way, but to like completely deny these people any love or any compassion or any like, you know, like, dude, you fucked up. Like, what happened? How do we get you back, you know? Like, but it's not, it's, it's like, let's destroy. And, and there's this, you know, it's just, there's, there's a part of the human heart that is just hardwired to, to destroy the, the other, whatever the other is. <laughs> you know, like the part of the adapters, like if we could just wipe away all these conservators, uh, then we'd have a great time, you know? And, and so it's, it's like, I think it's, but love has a way of spreading itself. Um, and this is where the own practice and is, is so important because it, it builds and grows your limbic system. And from what I've seen from things like S-Factor, they do that too. Like you have a body-based limbic system which can spread love, which can spread joy, which can spread clarity. You can actually spread 
clarity and you can um, you can get into dialogue in a way that you can hear the other side and that and that sometimes takes a hell of a long time and and people are kind of thick skinned but you can you can start a conversation and once the conversation is started and it's going it tends to keep going and you'll always have your like you know like in South Africa you had your Mandela who was like I'm going to talk to these people and then you had a few people in the Africana apartheid nationalist party who was like guys this shit is not working like we got to go speak to them and then once they started talking it took like five or six years but so I think dialogue is is kind of where it's where it's at so hopefully we're just like getting smarter as a species maybe maybe yeah I think I think we are I think we are I mean I'm, I just think of like things like you know, I've like recently developed an interest in art and it's not my first rodeo. Like I've gone, but all I could do was go to a life drawing class in a strange part of London. And now from Instagram, I can learn like, and, and you can do that with everything. And so I think that the tools for empowering yourself, if you're one of the people that's determined to have a dialogue are like enormous. And so those who want to have a dialogue are going to have it. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, We will continue the conversation next week. and, And thanks, everyone, for coming.